Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Jan San 2021, The Next Normal. My name is Dr. Felicia Townsend, and I'm the program director for the ISSA Hygiea Network. For those of you who are not familiar with the Hygiea Network, our mission is to provide programs, tools, and support that enable women in various sectors in the cleaning industry to accelerate their careers and achieve their full potential. This webinar is sponsored by American Paper Converting, which is a successful minority and woman-owned business. I want to give a special thank you to Lydia Work, who is the president of American Paper Converting, and Lydia is also a Hygiea Network Council member. Thank you so much, Lydia. Before I introduce our moderator and panelists, I encourage you throughout the webinar to refer to the Q&A area on your dashboard and type your questions. When we get to the Q&A portion of the discussion, the panel will do their best to address as many questions as possible. So let's get started. The moderator for today's discussion is Rachel Petoskey, who serves as the VP of Sales for Nilfisk. Rachel also serves as a member of the ISSA Hygiea Network Mentoring Committee. Our panelists include Laura Maesha, who is the industry manager for Klein and Company. Patrick Mullen, who is the chief operating officer for Harvard Maintenance. Jason Tillis, president of Imperial Dade. And Christine Tucker, <laughs> Vice President and General Manager for the Clorox Company's Professional Products Division. So as you can see, we have an esteemed panel with us today. I will now turn it over to Rachel to start the program. Perfect, thank you so much, Felicia. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, including our panelists who we're gonna hear from in just a moment. Uh, again, my name is Rachel and I will be today's moderator. As Felicia mentioned, I work for Nilfisk, a professional cleaning equipment company, uh, so I too can attest to the fact that clean is changing. Uh, and while most of us in the industry have long known the importance of clean, the COVID-19 pandemic has now shined a spotlight on Jansan, forever changing the way the world views cleaning. Some of us became frontline workers, all of us became essential and critical to business operations. Today's discussion features experts from multiple segments of the industry, manufacturers, distributors, and building service contractors. I, like all of you, am uh, very eager to hear what they have to say and how they have been impacted um, and had to pivot uh, in today's world. To get things started, I'm gonna hand it over to our panelists, uh, Laura Maecha. During summer 2020, her firm, Klein & Company, surveyed over 500 industrial and institutional end users about the changes they've made at their facilities related to the pandemic. Laura is going to provide a brief presentation of the survey results, and then we'll drive right into our panel discussion. Laura? Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to be with you today, and I'm eager to uh, share some of our survey results with you. Um, but I think before we jump into our survey results, we are um, going to display a poll question on the screen for you. And um, we just kind of would love to see the audience's input since we have a lot of people assembled today on how um, do you see the changes the pandemic has created for the Jansen industry being temporary or long-term? So if you could take a moment and fill out that question, we'll share those results with you shortly. Okay, thank you. That was pretty quick. So um, most of you feel 51% feel the changes are here to stay, but 48% say the Jansen community will find a happy medium. So with that, let's jump into uh, some of the findings. Uh, Klein is a market research and consulting firm, and we've been tracking the INI &I industry for, um, for over four decades at Klein. So we do a lot of end user surveys. Uh, we also do a lot of B2B in-depth interviews with manufacturers, suppliers, BSCs in the space. And so, um, 
Through our research over the last year, we have found that it is totally a new era of cleanliness. And certainly, as Rachel said, our cleaning professionals are completely essential and at the forefront of um, managing the pandemic. But the big shift that we've seen is that they are cleaning for health rather than appearance. So, uh, you know, in the past where you'd want to see, you know, shiny floors and dust free surfaces, obviously that's still a priority, but it's more so now about disinfecting high touch surfaces, keeping hands clean, um, increased cleaning frequency, very much a focus on hand hygiene, hand sanitizers and soaps, a big emphasis on surface disinfection. And the, the big change too that we've heard about during our surveys is that cleaning professionals at many industrial and institutional facilities are now front and center. And it's actually provides reassurance to the public and is tangible proof that the facility is being cleaned frequently and that it is a safe place for them to be. Um, and as Rachel mentioned, we did a survey of over 500 end users last summer. This was conducted from June to August of last year to ask them about changes that they made at their facilities related to the pandemic. And um, so 75% had the biggest, uh, most prevalent change that was made was increasing the number of hand sanitizer uh, dispensers available throughout the facilities. And 57% say they have increased cleaning frequency um, of their buildings. 43% um, replaced manual hand soap dispensers with touch-free dispensers. And 38% have added signage on increased hand washing, hand hygiene, and social distancing protocols. 24% noted that they removed their air dryer systems and put paper towels in instead. And only 8% said that the brands of cleaning chemicals that they use has been impacted by COVID. And I thought that was an interesting statement uh, that it was so low because of all the, you know, out of stocks. Um, I would have thought that there would have been a little bit more shifting of brands last summer. Then another follow-up question to the types of changes that these facilities made was their expected length of the emergency measures. So there really was no clear answer or clear, you know, just as our poll, we kind of had it split 51, 48%. Um, it was the same with our survey. So um, what we saw overall was that 33% expected these measures would continue into 2021, but 22% said they expect no change back or that these changes will be in place for the foreseeable future. 18% said until there is a vaccine or treatment, 17% through the end of 2020, and only 11% thought it would it'd last for into the fall within a few months of the survey. One thing I thought it was important to note here though, it, it, you can see that we, we've given you the total responses, but then also across the various industry verticals that we surveyed. So the BSCs expected these measures to subside more quickly. Um, only 9% of them expected these to remain in place for a longer time frame, And then also among lodging and education end users that we surveyed, they felt like that these were more of, of those end users feel that these changes will be in place for a, a longer time frame. 36% of hotels and 34% of schools and colleges. Um, um, and then, so from those B2B interviews that we conduct, in addition to the structured surveys, um, we talked to business people and asked them what about the challenges and the opportunities. So these were the ones that kind of rose to the top in terms of what we're hearing. So the supply chain shortages obviously are a major challenge that the industry has been grappling with. Um, stockpiling of products, we have that as a, as a challenge. I mean, short term, it was is a good opportunity um, and, and we saw some sales growth as a result of that, but eventually, um, you know, when the frequency starts to subside a bit, we expect the stockpiling will lead to some flatness in the market as those end users start to use down those, those stockpiles. Certainly schools and business closures has been a challenge. There's been significantly reduced travel for both business and leisure. 
Um, working from home is expected to likely um, be over the long term in many industries. And so that may limit occupancy in office buildings in the long term. And also some of the UVC technology that's being used to kill germs in largely in the healthcare sector, if that starts to expand further into other segments of the marketplace, we could, could see some um, reduced demand for cleaning chemicals. On the flip side though, the opportunities that we feel um, will continue for uh, over the long term are the continued focus on hand hygiene and disinfection, certainly for the foreseeable future. The healthcare sector will continue to drive strong demand for cleaning products. Uh, especially long-term care, hospitals, and other healthcare facilities. As the economy starts to gradually reopen throughout the country, certainly the contract cleaners, restaurants, and education end use segments will certainly um, be buying more and more Janssen chemicals. Um, certainly, I think this is also a key opportunity for chemical suppliers to work with their customers in um, this space and provide guidance on what's the most efficient and most effect effective uh, cleaning practices. Um, and that we have absolutely seen some blurring of distribution channels as consumers have tended to buy more online during the pandemic, the professionals have as well. And so we've seen a lot of online and e-commerce uh, buying. Uh, either from distributor websites or Amazon and other independent sites for these products. Um, so going forward, we expect the germicidal categories will continue to see positive impacts um, as end users are very much focused on cleaning for health. The appearance improvement categories that are more related to, you know, floor waxes, buffs, sprays, furniture polish, glass cleaners, they will continue to be um, somewhat flat to depressed as those are not happening with as much frequency as the uh, disinfection and sanitizing. So those are just some of the general trends that we've uncovered with our research. And with that, I will turn it back to Rachel uh, to continue the panel discussion. Perfect, thank you really, uh, thank you, Laura, that's really, um... Uh, you know, I personally was making notes. It's really some great data and insight. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'm really interested to hear uh, what the other panelists have to say. So um, we're going to bring them in to join the discussion. Uh, before we ask our first question, though, I do just want to do a quick reminder to all of our attendees today that we will have a Q&A session towards uh, the end of the hour here. So please get your questions into that Q&A uh, uh, chat uh, function of the screen. Okay. Uh, so welcome, Patrick, Jason, Laura, and Christine. Uh, we're going to get into it in our first question. It's it, it's a big one. Uh, so um, and I think um, so. Our question is: How has this pandemic impacted how the world views cleaning? Uh, and I think uh, to get started, Patrick, do you mind uh, starting here and giving your perspective from the building service contractor side of things? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think the most profound changes that we're seeing in the industry uh, is, is really looking at the disinfecting processes that we are implementing. Uh, I don't believe that there is a single customer that hasn't reviewed specifications, frequencies, and layering in of a disinfecting program. Um, in that process, I, I really have found um, as we've moved through it, uh, many of the customers looking for best practices just across the board. Um, and that's continuing to evolve on a daily, if not monthly basis, for sure. Um, you know, programs and processes that people are looking for, uh, inclusive of eradicate, uh, uh, <clears throat> how to clean up COVID um, situations, uh, how to work with uh, customers and provide out uh, plans, uh, also product uh, information that people are looking for. All that is now documented in, in the majority of office spaces. Uh, so that it can be used and transferred to employees for comfort factors and understanding of, of protocols. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Patrick. And you had uh, specifically mentioned disinfectant, so I want to hand it over to Christine to see uh, what your insight is. Yeah, I mean, um, my perspective is, while this pandemic has been horrible um, personally on all of our lives and had a major impact, it has, for the Jan San industry, shown the true importance that cleaning and cleaners play in protecting public health how vital we are to the economy and 
you know, honestly, the, the folks in this industry truly are frontline heroes. Um, I think the uh, thing that we've realized, though, is there's lots of products out there that can kill germs. And what's really important is making sure people know how to use them. So training and in-servicing is critically important. Um, worker safety is also critically important. You just don't want to throw a whole bunch of chemicals and things at people and don't tell them how to use it and not think about the impact on the people that are applying the chemistries. So I think we have the opportunity to really play a leadership role in public health in restoring the company's, the country's economy. And it's actually a, a really exciting time to be part of the Janzan industry. Thanks, Christine. How about uh, Jason? What is your perspective coming from the distribution side of things? Yeah, and, and Christine just highlighted it, right? So Janzan and cleaning now was, was, has become such a focus in COVID. And I found the other strictly, again, strictly from a business perspective, I think COVID was really like this super accelerating event. And a lot of the trends are getting so much attention now and focus were actually trends that were happening anyway. They just happened much faster and got a lot more attention as a result of COVID. And from a distributor perspective, it's not so much that we had to adapt, it's that now there was so much more demand for what we were trying to offer the market. And now you had to do it in the face of a really challenged supply chain in really difficult conditions. And I do just want to take a second. I'm sure a bunch of the Imperial Date families on here and they should be recognized. I mean, Christine highlighted it. I mean, the team was really on the front lines the whole way from leadership all the way down to the warehouse and drivers. And uh, we had to face some really challenging situations like New York City in that April period, just to get these critical supplies to the marketplace, delivering healthcare and grocery was an incredibly heavy lift. And just providing those services was, was incredibly challenging. The team stepped up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, heroes out there that, that really do de deserve the, the recognition. Um, to just, uh, Jason, ask you to elaborate, is there anything specific uh, that, that your company did or just Janssen companies in general that you've uh, observed have done to adapt? No, to I would think it was almost like doubling down, right? So we did a lot of training. Now we made sure all the training was virtual. We made sure we were communicating it out, not only to our end users, but to all the customers. Um, we were always, I'll say, very collaborative with our, our manufacturing partners like Christina Clorox, right? But making sure, hey, when stuff is available, what's the innovation, how best to introduce it, how do we get it to the end users the fastest way possible, making sure they're prepared, making sure whatever the, the dispensing system is, we get the right product to go along with that, right? So it, it's really like there were times literally we'd be working with someone like Clorox to try and get someone like Harvard Maintenance and Pat critical right. goods. And all this is happening real time and information keeps changing. So I, I'll say all the resources were dedicated really to accomplishing these tasks. Okay, okay. And I um, actually want to uh, get the others to elaborate on that as well. Before I do that, Laura, um, so um, uh, as far as, I mean, all of your studies were really how the pandemic has imp impacted uh, and really the, the view of cleaning. Any major takeaway from you uh, from, from uh, data and uh, from, from that standpoint? Yeah, I mean, the, the main thing that we've seen over and over repeated across the different industry verticals is the focus on, you know, cleaning for health and disinfection and hand hygiene is far and away the biggest priority for, for the people doing the actual cleaning and, and making the de purchase decisions for these facilities. It's, um, you know, very much taken the front and center. And, and also just the fact that like, you know, these people are on the front line, but they were often not seen. They were being, you know, cleaning after hours or, you know, kind of behind the scenes and they're now front and center. And it's, you know, it's good because it helps the public feel reassured because they see the, the wiping and the right. disinfecting happening before their eyes. Right, right. So along those lines, so so Patrick, your team, um, you know, they were the ones doing the visible cleaning. Um, how specifically did you have to adapt? Uh, absolutely. A, a lot of training. Uh, our eh &S program at Harvard really accelerated. Uh, it had always been a big part of our organization. Uh, it, it became absolutely quintessential uh, to our success, being able to get information out to our employees, being able to, to work with our vendors and our suppliers. Um, you know, a, a tremendous move uh, with people towards quality. I, I really believe that, that people started to really impact the idea of quality uh, of service, quality of brand. Brand recognition became a very big piece of it as well. Um, you know, the, the Clorox people, um, the... Uh, Purell, uh, this, these, were the, these were the brand names that people want to see in their facilities. And it, it really uh, has held true and it continues to hold true to this day um, right now that, that people have gone to quality. Uh, people are looking for an enhanced service level. 
uh, the disinfecting programs that are being implemented, uh, the cadence of them, the timing of them, uh, to make sure that they can provide, you know, as, as uh, facility managers, uh, the safest place possible for individuals to come and re-enter uh, the, the office environments. Mm -hmm. so. Right. And, and Laura, I think your, uh, the results that you showed it actually uh, mentioned that, you know, brand wasn't, didn't seem to be a huge factor after a certain point. Um, so with that, we have, uh, again, Christine, for, with, with Clorox, uh, which we know we could not get on the shelves. So um, just as, from a manufacturing perspective, Christine, how, um, how have you seen uh, that segment of the industry had to adapt? Yeah, so I think, you know, there were, there were two things. The very first thing was we had to figure out how to get supply of critical disinfectants to the places needed most. And it's no secret that was a massive challenge, and it still is a massive challenge for the industry. The supply chains for these types of products industry-wide were built for pretty steady consumption, and we were seeing demand on product lines range from 500% to 3,000% increases in demand. And when you go all the way through the supply chain from raw materials to sourcing that aren't even within the control of a manufacturer, all of those supply chains were challenged. So that has been our primary focus right. is to figure out how to get the right critical disinfectants into supply to where they're needed the most. And we still have more progress to make. We have some product lines we've achieved it on and we have some we still need to make more progress. Um, so that would be, I'd say the first thing. The second thing that's happened is um, we have found, we always thought of um, disinfecting and cleaning in businesses as a back of house arrangement. And most of our customers thought of it as a line item, as a cost. And what we're now seeing, particularly for some major brands that interact with the public businesses, they're seeing that this can be a revenue driver by partnering with the right disinfecting brands in front of house activities. And so we're seeing a lot of that pick up in interest in cleaning and disinfecting and the activities and the protocols and processes for name brands. And it's not a secret who we've signed contracts with, but like with United Airlines or AMC theater, theaters or Enterprise Rental Car, they're seeing this now as a revenue driver to show their customers it's safe to come back. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we're seeing brands start to play much more strongly in B2B cleaning. Very interesting. Uh, Jason, Patrick, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I don't want to just keep agreeing with Christine, but I agree. Like I, I actually, I, I believe marketing cleanliness is going to be the norm. And I think the brand names in that regard are going to have a really big impact. I think you guys did a deal with the NBA as well. Perhaps. We did. And they had no COVID infections in their bubble. And I wouldn't want to say that's a correlation between our protocols and products, but people can read between the lines. And we do a bunch of work with different stadiums and whatnot, and you're continuing to hear, right? Because so much of it is just being like, I'll say, transparent about cleaning and letting the, the customer, letting our end users' customers know what's happening to keep them safe. Absolutely. I mean, it's it, it continues to, to play out as we speak. I think the interesting part now is from a cleaning perspective, where typically we were dealing with facilities management um, personnel, um, you know, other people along the supply chain requirements. These conversations now are taking place with the CEOs, CFOs, and COOs of every major company out there, and people that are very engaged in, in bringing a safe environment to, in, their, in their workplace and for their, their staff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we're going to see things moving in a direction. And, and you know, we've talked about partnering and we talk about collaboration with each other, uh, but as a, a cleaning provider, uh, dealing with Jason as a supplier, uh, dealing with Christine as, as a manufacturer, all of us are going to be together meeting with these clients and having these discussions on best practices and all the what if questions that are out there. Uh, I think people really have appreciated the work that everyone has done, um, which has been amazing across the board. And I think the next question will be, how do we do it better? And, um, and, and finding those products and coming up with those answers are going to be what we're going to be spending a lot of time doing uh, in the near future. So along those lines of, of, of how, how we do it better, um, so certainly a lot of challenges that we face, we've all had, had to adapt, but it, there's also been a lot of silver linings where we've learned that we could work differently or maybe it fueled innovation. Uh, what new challenges and opportunities are on the horizon for your industry sector? Jason, we'll start with you. Sure. You, you know, I, I think, look, as leaders, right, it's always our job to kind of work through challenges and make them opportunities. So I, I think the big opportunity is, right, so now Jansan is in the forefront. Like, 
you know, uh, I, I think it was Pat who mentioned, right? Like you now are getting audience with the CEO to talk about what the chemical program is, right? What's the sanitizing program? I was watching a Nick game the other night and it was a commercial for some like gorgeous resort. And instead of talking about the amenities, the spa, the views or whatever else, they were literally marketing how well they clean their resort, right? And I, and I, I think if you're a restaurant, you know, when you want to have people come into your place, you might talk a little bit about the food, but you're almost talking as much about what are you doing to keep the environment safe. So I really think the opportunity is that and doing that properly, making sure the end users are trained properly, making sure they're exposed to the best innovations. And I'm probably, I don't believe that necessarily so much has actually changed. And that's kind of where I was going before with this. Like, it's not that Clorox, they might have had some innovations, but they didn't come out with, uh, you know, a hundred new items. It's really marketing and making available in a challenging supply environment, all these products that do work in different ways. And I know like, Pat, I'm assuming at Harvard Maintenance, right? You guys offered a lot of these sanitizing and disinfecting programs before, but you might not have had customers be willing to either pay for them or have the same appetite to listen to them, right? So I think it's, I don't want to speak for you, but I believe that would be the case. So I think a lot of it is just making sure as a distributor, we stay in front of these things and we are arming our sales force and our end users with all the information, training and supplies they need to run their businesses more efficiently. Yeah, Absolutely. and I think that's, sorry, I was gonna say, I think that is probably one of the biggest challenges that we face. So when you have a lot of opportunity and growth, it attracts a lot of participants. And there is a flood of new products and you know miracle cures out there claiming they can do things that maybe haven't thought through all the appropriate protocols and the things that make it safe for the operator. That's probably one of our biggest concerns is making sure that protocols and processes people are putting in place are actually safe for the people that are using them. And they have the proper PPE and they've been trained on how to use it appropriately, that they're not overusing or underusing. And so I think that is one of the challenges is as we get past the pandemic and sort of the, the panic, how do we get to the right normal where we're doing the right level of disinfection to deal with the risk, right? Because, you know, overdoing it isn't good either. <laughs> so I think there's going to be a little bit of getting some sanity back in the process as we get through into the new normal. But I think the other thing that's interesting is I don't think disinfecting and sanitizing go away if COVID gets under control. Because one of the other things is we've become much more aware of all the community acquired infections that have always been there. I mean, the industry would lose $87 billion a year to flu infections. Look at what's happened to the flu rate in the last year, right? It's been significant, you can't say it's causal, but doing these processes would limit that transmission, norovirus, MRSA, whatever the next pandemic is. So I think that's part of, this becomes the new way to keep our economies healthy and our public safer from a health perspective. But doing it the right and safe way, I think is gonna be the challenge for our industry. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more with you on that, Christina. The, the piece for us really is, uh, you know, everyone's saying cleaning for wellness, and, and I agree with that uh, all the way. Um, but also the aesthetics of the space will be part of that process. Um, right now, we're, we're dealing with in commercial office space somewhere under 20% occupancy in those facilities. Um, but eventually, as people come in, uh, you know, aesthetic uh, cleaning is going to be maintained. And as I mentioned before, layering in a quality disinfecting program. Uh, that is visible, that people can see with the proper training that's taking place. Um, you know, I think it's just an incredible opportunity. I only think we're at the beginning of it where, you know, customers are coming to us and asking us for our professional opinion on how do we do this better. Mm -hmm. And so as an industry across the board and, and all of the related uh, processes that we're all involved in, we have a chance to really contribute here in a huge way. Uh, I would tell you that we're spending a ton of time reading. There's great articles that are out there right now. Uh, innovations that are taking place, best practices that are happening. Uh, so being part now of a very cooperative environment where we're able to bring ideas, thoughts, functions together, uh, I think is, is, is somewhat of a change in the industry. And uh, I'm enjoying that quite a bit because um, we're able to implement better. We're able to see the future a little bit more. We, we start to understand a little bit more about the product lines that are coming, that will be coming and that are available to us at this point and how we can plan to implement some of those changes and do our beta testings on them and so forth. So it's an exciting time. I mean, a lot of opportunities there. And I agree with Jason, there's always going to be a challenge uh, in the processing. Um, you know, one of the biggest thing in challenging is really getting people to change, you know, how they operated prior to COVID, you know, uh, social changes, social awareness, uh, you know, just getting people to stop shaking hands, 
fist bumps, hugging each other. Uh, it's, it's a monumental task. Um, eating in groups, uh, those things have all broken down now. We've, we've worked very hard to get people to change that to create a safer environment at the end of the day. So uh, it, it's an interesting time and a, a definite time of change. Laura, how about anything from, from your research, any trends that stand out as far as um, opportunities, challenges on, on the horizon? A lot of opportunities, I think, for uh, brands to interact with cleaning professionals um, via online, e-commerce, digital, um, you know, as that's become, you know, there's always sort of a bleed from consumer cleaning into the professional world and, and vice versa. Um, so we are seeing that there's, you know, definitely a request or a need for what's the most efficient way to clean my facility, what's the best practice, but also, you know, there's a lot of looking stuff up online, looking for those specifications, and so there's opportunities there for brands to kind of, you know, interact with those cleaning professionals and, you know, reinforce the safe practices. Um, we're, we're hearing that from, from our surveys as well. Okay, and, and I'm actually, I'm going to uh, jump off that, that uh, your comments for a second, Laura. Um, so I think, and, and it sh showed in the results, just as far as you know, people going online to try to uh, find what they need it. Uh, and uh, back in, I think, 2018, there, there actually was an article that came out, I think it was from another distributor in the industry that had done um, some research. Um, and they had found that the Jansen industry, back, again, back in 2018, uh, they were still adapting a little bit and, and, and uncovering how to best use e-commerce and digital platforms within the Jansan industry. Um, so I guess uh, I'm going to throw this to, to Christine and, and, and Jason as far as what you see specifically for your industry sectors um, and how, uh, you know, have you seen a, a change as far as e-commerce goes? Yeah, I mean, I, I can start. I mean, I think, um, yes more people are using online tools to learn about products, to learn, to get information, to do training. I mean, it, it's human nature. People were at home. We all are having to learn to use technology, to communicate, to train on products. We were having to use videos because there couldn't be in-person training. So people have gotten more comfortable mm -hmm. interacting digitally. And that does mean there will be a, a tailwind of more people apt to look at e-commerce type solutions for parts of their purchases. I don't see it going full, you know, student body left because there is so much more to the process, to the in-servicing, to helping with solutions and protocols in unique opportunities. But I do think it's going to be playing an increasing role. It's been accelerated because of the pandemic, probably five years faster, right? Mm -hmm. um, and everyone in the industry needs to figure out how we are going to adapt to leverage these tools for the best end use and outcome. So I don't think we can put our head in the sand and say, we don't want it to be here. It's here, it's a factor. Right. Um, and it's figuring out how to use it best within your business model and to help end users. Right. Yeah, so, and we think of e-commerce two ways. So we have a B2B ordering platform that's grown pretty consistently over the years. And for some end users, it works great. For some end users, it's less effective, but it depends. And again, we continue to add features and I think people appreciate them and it's highly customizable. And that's kind of been an existing tool. What we really doubled down on though is the education and training side of the business. Um, which we'd lump under e-com as well. Like we send out a list every Friday of, of webinars to the group to do trainings. I mean, we've had, I, I don't know how many Zoom meetings with large end users across multiple states to make sure everybody's doing things the right way. And again, you'd love to do as much of that. Like I can't imagine training on how to best do floor care will always be done on Zoom, right? Like there's, there's a certain things that are better in person, I, I, that's where I think it's, I think it's gonna be a great complementary tool, especially when it comes to training and education. And I think, you know, I knock on wood, right? As vaccine data and things start to look better, I think, you know, hopefully we'll get to a hybrid version there as well, where you're getting kind of the best of both worlds. Um, but I would agree, significant uptick, uh, an accelerator, like I talked about earlier, um, focus on leveraging the web. Um, and I think it'll also, it'll be used to supplement a lot of the in-person stuff that went on before. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a moment to just pause here. Um, again, I want to remind everybody, all of our attendees, uh, that uh, we will be doing a Q&A session here shortly. I do see that we have a lot coming in, so that's, that's fantastic. So be sure to get uh, your question entered. Um, 
So uh, I think it's time. Let's do do a, a quick poll. We're going to change gears a little bit with our our, our um, uh, discussion topic. So the pandemic changed how and where we all work, uh, at least for those that report it to an office on a regular basis. Uh, so let us know those that are uh, tuning in today. Where are you working from? Are you 100% back to the office? Are you still working from home, or are you still splitting your time between office and home? And the results are in. So it shows uh, interesting uh, mix. So uh, just under 50% are still working from home, 24% uh, back to the office, and about 30% are still splitting their time between their office and their home. Um, so based off of that, um, if you could all speak a little bit to, um, you know, what, what you have, have done in your organizations or what you've seen in your segments to be able to bring people back to the office. Well, um, Go ahead, Pat. Uh, so, uh, at Harvard Maintenance right now, um, obviously, uh, we've taken the responsibilities of making sure that employees that come to work um, are using proper PPE in the facilities at all time. Um, we've worked with social distancing. Uh, we've had training and toolbox talks with all of our employees as far as conduct in the workplace, what's now socially acceptable as opposed to a year ago. Um, we've also done a lot of um, checking in from uh, facilities in terms of when people enter our facility, uh, they scan in, um, they put their information in there as well, as far as if they've been anywhere, if they've been outside of the United States, et cetera. Um, we have protocols in place for anyone who's had exposure to, uh, to COVID, uh, required time away from the office, if that be the case, um, and then requirements for them to return to the office as well. And again, this is for their protection as well as everybody in the facility. Um, you know, it's it's a very sensitive matter as you work your way through this process. Um, you know, people uh, are, are private in general, so we're asking people to to give us some information for the betterment of the organization, for the betterment of their coworkers. Um, and as that process has taken place, people have gotten more comfortable. Um, and and I think that's that's a big change to the social norm of what we've seen in the past. So transparency. Uh, has been greatly appreciated and it's also allowed us to be able to function organizationally from our office areas for the past year. So very fortunate along those lines. Yeah, I mean, this could almost be a, a webinar in itself, right? Or a panel because th th there's so much um, to this. I, I think I mentioned earlier, right? So uh, we have so many essential workers, right? People on the front lines. So I, I think we were we did everything we could to be, if we weren't first in the market, we were certainly, certainly very early on on getting PPE to all employees and, and really trying to be proactive in that regard. Um, and specifically to your question, because so many of our key people have to be in the building, you know, leadership, including myself, we, uh, like I quarantined for my family for 60 days coming in every day. And that was the expectation at our, you know, 40 plus facilities around the country. Right. Essentially, leadership had to be here, and uh, the essential workers did as well, obviously. And then with the office, right, we did everything we could to socially distance. Um, we turned on the option to remote work really quickly. And again, some of this stuff was, I remember, I think it was one day we got, our IT group got up like 60 or 70 devices, which is a super heavy lift, because again, it was, we just didn't have a ton of time. And then more specifically, in terms of just protocols, we created a COVID task force. We were having daily calls at one point, now it's weekly temperature checks. Um, we made testing available. If we had to pay for testing, we paid for, I mean, basically whatever we had to do to try and get that accomplished. And then obviously uh, when there were positive tests, we did full contact tracing and that stuff is all still happening today. We have actually had more, um, I'll say just office workers that didn't essentially have to be in the building coming back now, again, in a limited scale, we've actually taken on some additional office space, which I know is unique because so many people have went the other way, but we've taken on some additional space to make sure we can provide safe environments to get more people back. Cause I am a believer um, you do get better productivity, better collaboration, whatever. Like, again, Zoom is great. I think if we were together, right, it, it kind of just takes it up another level. And uh, we've been really clear employee safety is, is where it starts and stops. It's our priority. Great. So I'd say the, the answer for Clorox or manufacturer is a multi-layered answer. Um, clearly, our um, P3 
peers that are in the production organization on the manufacturing line were essential workers and didn't have a day out of being on site um, because they needed to be there making disinfectants for the marketplace. So, you know, all the PPE, all the protocols, everything we could do, we did enhance pay, enhance incentives. We provided a million dollar employee COVID relief fund if there were any COVID related expenses for our frontline workers. And so that, that we've been very focused at supporting that because they became a, a critical asset for the company to sort of fight the war on COVID and we needed them there doing what they could do and be healthy while they're doing it. For the balance of our organization, our office organization, we have been pretty much remote completely um, since this early March. Being based in California, I think we were the first state to shut down. Um, and so we've had to get very adept at working remotely virtually, doing Zoom, figuring out all these different tools. And I'm actually in slightly a different place than Jason. I think many, many jobs can be done as effectively remotely as they can be done in person. That's good. Um, we have been agreeing too much. So that's yeah, good. we've been agreeing too much. It depends on the role, the nature of the work. I think being in person is more fun. I'm a huge extrovert. I would prefer to be in person from a, a social and a collaboration basis. But I think we've been able to figure out how to work really well with those tools. And I think as we look forward, the new normal of what work looks like is going to be very different and more layered based on the type of work people do than it was pre-COVID. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. So we're going to uh, switch gears again really quick. This might be our last question or so before we get into the Q&A uh, from, from our audience. Uh, but as you know, uh, Hygieia, we're dedicated to the advancement of uh, women within the cleaning industry. Um, and I'm sure that we've all seen the articles regarding um, just how it's impacted uh, 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 fam family life. Uh, and we've seen that, that women specifically have been leaving the workforce at a much higher rate. Um, Generally speaking, how has the pandemic impacted diversity in the workplace, both short term and long term? We will go to Christine. She's shaking her head. Okay. Um, well, and, and I'm going to go off book a little bit. Um, I think it's it's clear that with schools being closed, a disproportionate burden of educating children at home usually fell to typically fell to the female in the family, and that has been a big contributor. I think to part of the um, step back for women in the workforce. I know at Clorox, we tried to provide support tools. We allowed employees, we could work part-time without it you know, impacting for a period of time to deal with their, the responsibilities at home that were brought on by um, kids not being able to be at school. So I think the biggest thing we can do is get kids back to school, right? Um, will help alleviate some of the pressure. I think if I toggle it away from just the female focus, I think we are a very people-centered company and um, we've been deeply engaged at how we confront bias in the workplace from wherever that bias can be. And part of that is distance bias, which I think is why I'm a different place than Jason on the working remotely. We've been very upfront if we need to figure out how do you confront distance bias and work better together regardless of our situations. Um, we also have increased our spending with um, minority and women-owned businesses as a company. We've um, doubled our investment to address this conscious and unconscious bias. We are materially increasing our recruiting focus on underserved communities. So we are actively trying to take actions. And we have a requirement now that all our executive team members have to volunteer within an organization that fights for equality and justice in some way, shape or form. So this is something we are embracing as a company pretty wholeheartedly. If you've seen our CEO, which happens to be a female, we have one of 38 females of Fortune 5, there's 38 female Fortune 500 CEOs, and we have one of them. Um, this has very much been one of the missions that she's trying to push in the industry. Fantastic. Thank you, Christine. I, I'd like, to, so since you mentioned Hygieia, I do want to congratulate, by the way, Imperial Day Zone, I wanted to start with this, but we kind of jumped in. Laura Craven uh, was recently appointed co-chair. I, I might be biased, but I think that was a tremendous choice for the organization. Uh, going to do uh, some tremendous things in that role. Um, so I, I think it's a few different things. I, when I think about, so I, I think this is another one of those trends that was there pre-COVID. And again, it got accelerated, kind of got put, you know, to the front burner by, uh, from, uh, I'll say, a, a talk, it's being talked about a lot more is what I would say for sure. And I think we're fortunate in that I, I think we've, we have a pretty diverse group and, and I don't think you can be a great company without diversity, right? Um, I think you need differing opinions. I think you need differing view side, uh, points of view on things, differing perspectives. So we're, we're embracing that. I think we've, we've already begun the process of leveraging Laura and Hygieia to talk about, you know, further diversity opportunities for Imperial Day within the industry and within our employees. 
And, uh, you know, it's something we brought on a new CHRO recently. That was a big topic as well. And, and it's really just trying, I think, to provide the best opportunities possible across the board. And, and that's really how we're thinking about it. Great. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing at Harvard. Um, Harvard's owned by the Dubin family. Uh, Natalie Dubin has taken a very leadership role in this process um, as far as as WeBank is concerned, and as far as the company is concerned, as far as growing um, all of our employees in this process, I think what's, what's been wonderful, and I do agree with Christine, um, instead of having to find employees or go out and, and hire new people or people being forced to quit, uh, working remotely has been a great opportunity. I mean, I give people a lot of credit who are able to do balance both their home life and their work life, uh, but the pr productivity is there at the end of the day. Um, the, the work is being accomplished, uh, it's being achieved. People are able to continue to pursue their careers. Um, and, and, and to tell you the truth for us, it's, it's really been a matter of keeping our talent um, during a very, um, you know, uh, a, a very strange time. You know, um, we've asked a lot of people. Uh, I think in certain cases, our production has gone up uh, with people working from home. Uh, removal of the uh, commute, I, I see people online at eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night uh, finishing up their uh, requirements. Um, but that's, that's just, you know, indicative of, of the family requirement and everything else that's taking place. Um, you know, in my home, it's a very healthy 90-10 split of requirements. And, uh, you know, my wife is working both at home and working with my kids, and it's not an easy process. Mm -hmm. uh, but she has been able to maintain uh, her career uh, and, and also be able to, uh, to, to handle her, the, the home responsibilities as children are suffering through this process as well. So um, very, very proud of what Harvard has been able to do in that process and very proud of, of the people who've worked for us and what they put forward. And I should clarify, anyone obviously who has any challenges or results of schools being closed, we're, we still have, I mean, we have hundreds of people working remote. I think my comment was more that I don't believe, like there's a whole thesis around there that, that I'll call it offices are dead, right? And you're never going to see, I don't believe that to necessarily be the case. I think you might see people working three days a week in the office, two days remote. Like I think the, the remote is going to be a component of work. And I think when done properly, especially depending on the industry, you can get productivity. I think as a distributor, it's, it's a slightly different, but um, I, I think it's going to be, I do believe though they're actually, and it's one of the reasons why I'm pretty optimistic about the business. I do believe you're going to get a return to work mm -hmm. sometime over the next six months in a way that's going to be better than I hope people expect. A little, little bit more, more flexible for everybody. Agreed. Perfect. Thank you all. Um, so we have a lot of questions, uh, so which, is, which is great. So I'm going to jump into um, our first one here is from uh, Kevin and he is saying his question is uh, uh, to you, Jason, uh, as a manufacturer and wholesaler of disinfecting and sanitizing wipes, what is most important to Jansan distributors when deciding on what to buy? Well, so for on wipes in particular over the past six months is did the product exist and would they deliver, right? I think that was kind of the priority. Seems, uh, yeah. She's agreeing I mean, with you again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Chris, right. I mean, at one point, when you talk about stuff being 3000% up, that was really the, the wipe category is the one that probably had the most extreme demand without the ability to scale supply, like even sanitizer seemed to be able to get ramped quickly. You had alcohol companies converting. Some of that stuff was crazy, by the way, that really smelled like tequila. We could talk mm -hmm. about that in a separate conversation. <laughs> but, the, but the wipes, um, look, for a long time, it was this product available. I think now it's, it's actually come online and you're seeing a bunch of really interesting alternatives. Clorox is now shipping some. Um, we have some other uh, manufacturers that we're pretty close with on this. And, you know, I, I can't say it's one particular thing. I think it depends on what the application you're using it for and, and what fits uh, best, but but availability and reliability is right at the top with the proper kill claims and you know understanding what application it could best be used for. Christine, Patrick, anything to add? I'm not disagreeing with Jason at all. <laughs> Great. Um, the next one uh, is from uh, Diego, and uh, I, I don't recall specifically who said this, but I do remember. Who could you uh, could or could you expand on the blurring of distribution channels as distributors? How do you address this? And I think actually we touched on this a little bit when we talked about e-commerce. E um, I could just comment on that quickly, Rachel. Uh, what we have seen over the last, say, five 
10 years as we track the industry is that uh, it used to be the, the bulk of, of sales of these products went either direct from the chemical companies through and through distributors um, and with a small portion being like retail and online. And now the retail and online piece has really expanded in terms of percent of, of total sales um, with things like, you know, home, home depots, uh, home improvement stores, office supply stores, general supply distributors, um, just kind of blurring and, and people getting these products from a much more diverse group of either brick and mortar or online um, distribution channels. Thank you. Anybody else have anything else to add? All right. We have one here from Brad. Uh, this uh, is targeted to you, Christine. How do you think supply chain will be changing going forward? Will it continue to be based on steady demand or will there be some modification to your planning, warehousing, et cetera? So there, there already are modifications. I think we've realized that we need to have a much more, I think the industry has realized there needs to be a much right. more flexible supply chain on wipes in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a very capital intensive and complex. It doesn't seem complex, but it's a very complex um, end to end supply chain um, from sourcing materials through producing end product. So we are working through different models of how to have more flexible responsive supply chains. Um, I do think, you know, depending on what happens to demand as, I do believe demand will be materially higher than it was pre COVID going state, but I do think it will come down from the hysteria right, of sort of the March through September standpoint. And there's been a lot of capacity that's been added into the industry to try and take advantage of that. Um, and so I think there may be some right sizing of that capacity, but I think there will be assets that allow for demand flexibility, supply flexibility as we hit peaks and valleys. So this is something we are actively working on as a company and I would imagine many others are as well. <laughs> I would just add, and again, I'm going to have to agree with her on this. You're right. We, this comes up pretty much in all our vendor discussions now is, hey, what really is capacity? How do we make sure we don't go down this path again? Because we, we take a lot of pride in how great our vendor partner relationships are. And there were obviously some challenging times during, throughout the early days of COVID. And with the amount of additional investment being made in, call it wipes, sanitizer, some of these other key products, I actually, I think there probably will have to be a right sizing um, at some point in the future as well. Uh, but the other thing I think is real, like, I don't think we ever go back to a pre-COVID view on cleaning, at least I use the term foreseeable future, right? Three to five years beyond that, who knows what happens in the world? Like the good hygiene practices now, they're, they're just core to our day to day. Like people aren't going to, I don't see myself washing hands less, right? I just don't see, you know, I, I think people are going to be really conscious of how you get sick. I think you look at the flu data, right? I think the flu is like plummeted this year. Like th that stuff people are going to be cognizant of for a long time. So again, I think you have a way more supply coming online. I think you have demand that's probably getting close to a steady state and then we'll see where the world is. I would agree. I would agree with Jason in terms of disinfecting. It's, it's, it's not changing anytime soon. It's, it's, a, it's a product that's going to be part of our, our general product line going forward. Um, and I, I also believe you know we're part of the problem because we've stockpiled uh, uh, materials uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a high rate as well. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're able to provide, um, you know, services to all of our clients. Um, and then of course, with our vendors being able to support us in that process, if there is any hiccups or, or, or disturbances to the uh, supply chain. So um, I think that that portion is, has, I think we're through that portion as far as that's concerned, but to figure out what the steady requirements will be, you'll see in the next probably 90 days. Uh, the next question is from Rex. What will the growth in the internet of things uh, look like in our industry? Will automated cleaning or automated task management be in highest demand? Patrick, you want to take that one or start uh, off with, I should say. Sure. sure. Um, well, I, I think that, that people are going to want to um, follow all the tasks that are being provided. Uh, they're going to want to see that the work is done. As I mentioned earlier, it is definitely a transition to quality. So people want the service. They expect the service. Um, you, know, it, you know, people are viewing what's taking place in their facilities um, when people are actually working because through camera systems, et cetera, so through surveillance systems. Uh, so they wanna make sure that the work that, that they're asking for is being performed and being performed properly um, and in the cadence of, of what their contracts call for. 
So uh, that is absolutely happening. I, I absolutely see that technology is going to play uh, and continue to play a big role. Um, it was already moving in that direction, uh, especially when it came to quality control, uh, when it came to inspections. Uh, I think this is just an enhancement um, or will be an enhancement that will be added to um, you know, technology as far as being able to follow supplies, be able to follow services, be able to, to manage that process. So I think it's just about transparency. Jason, are you seeing anything from, from your customer base as far as automated cleaning? Similar, right, these automated machines and certain, uh, you know, new technologies around, you know, through the cloud, you could actually see how many people are using what dispensers throughout the day. Like this stuff was there pre-COVID, I think similar to almost where we began. Like I think people and users are now much more willing to have these conversations, make investments in them to get a better view. And also to then be able to provide transparency about how clean the facility is, right? That's what a lot of this is going to come back to is provide transparency around how well things are being cleaned, right? Actually prove, hey, we cleaned this this many times a day. Just how many people went through it. Like, I think that's the data people are going to want. But again, it's not that any of this is so like groundbreaking or new. It's just going to become so much more of a focus. It's going to be perceived as new innovation. And Rachel, if I could just add to that, um, I see Internet of Things and those, you know, being able to, to see real time what's been done in these facilities as, as something that will like Jason said, be a forward looking, you know, presented almost to the customers. Um, but it does seem also because there is so much more frequency of cleaning that it just is a needed tool now to keep track of who's done what, make sure it's, it's, it's done um, regularly um, and maybe show that to your customers. But we also hear that from the food service side too, where internet of things and keeping, you know, making sure the wear wash machine temperatures are, are correct and there's correct sanitizing in the you know food um, preparation and service areas is going to be crucial I think to um, you know propelling the the restaurant industry into yeah. reopening. At Imperial at Imperial Day we've exposure to really both sides right Jansen and food service and we see almost total parallel yeah, there might be some nuance there but I mean it's mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. The next question um, also comes from Kevin. What is the biggest differences between disinfecting and sanitizing? And I think uh, we all uh, learned that we needed to, uh, there were some opportunities to educate uh, the market on, on some of those differences. Anybody want to take that one? All right. So this is going to be a little embarrassing because I should be able to answer this, but I'm going to give a little disclaimer that I got straight C's in high school science. So I get it <laughs> right-ish, not right. Um, <laughs> Disinfecting is a higher level log kill of the germs. So I believe disinfecting, you have to be 9.9999, where sanitizing is a lower level of like 99. So it basically is complete eradication versus you got a lot of it. Um, and there are certain viruses and bacteria that you have to have a disinfectant to deal with. They can't be controlled by a sanitizer. But like I said, right-ish, C's in high school science. Yep, and so yeah, if and my R&D people are listening, they're cringing a little bit that I didn't have this. Well, certainly topic. ISSA has a lot of resources, I'm sure, on that topic, so yeah. we can go in the right direction. <laughs> um, and then the next one is around uh, green cleaning. How has the pandemic uh, impacted or affected the use of green chemicals? So I'm just interested from uh, the seat all of you sit in, are you are you seeing more of a demand from for from it for your customers or your, your, your end users as well? Um, I would start by saying that I don't believe that we've really stopped with the green cleaning programs. I think they're still in full force and effect and the expectation is that that will be there. Um, we have had to layer in disinfectants uh, for the safety of, of the inhabitants of the office. Um, I believe that, that those products will continue to be modified um, as we go forward. Um, I, I see at this particular time, uh, green being as prevalent today as it will be in the future. I think that as, as we work our way through the disinfecting processes, and I'm, I'm very interested to see what chemical lines will be coming out, uh, you know, as far as to, to modify uh, if it is uh, if it is at all possible, again, a C, I got the D in science, by the way. Um, if it is at all possible to to modify those components and and move them more toward a greener uh, uh, program, 
that may be impossible, but I think that that will be things that will, will come with improvement as we move forward. Uh, but most companies, uh, I, I can tell you almost every company I've dealt with uh, has modified and allowed a disinfectant into their facility. Uh, I know people don't love it, but it is right now at this time, the safest way to go uh, in maintaining their facilities in a healthy environment. I would say also short term, our surveys, we've seen a bump up in the use of antibacterial hand soaps, which had previously been trending downward with some concerns about resistance mm -hmm. and overuse of antibac hand soaps, but with COVID that, you know, came right back up. But I will say also that as, as Patrick mentioned, I don't think green went anywhere. It just sort of has changed in some respects and many end users are looking at various facets of being sustainable, like using less water, you, you know, less plastic packaging, using more, you know, kind of concentrates. Um, so there's a lot of, even if you add, you know, add a disinfectant into the natural based ingredients, still um, I think at the forefront of their overall cleaning program, trying to be as, as green and sustainable as possible. Yep. Yeah, and Lauren, you touched on sustainability. We do have a specific question uh, regarding that it was a large trend pre-COVID. Does the panel foresee positive or negative effects on this trend as businesses adapt uh, you know, new or increased cleaning processes? I actually thought that was, if you were to ask me pre-COVID what the biggest trend was, it was really around sustainability. Uh, it just, I mean, the whole world then transitioned to just trying to keep people healthy. Yep. And if it was sustainable, great. If it wasn't, that was kind of great too. As long as, again, the biggest thing was what was available that would keep people safe. I do think once we get out of that mindset, and we're really close to there, I mean, I hope, again, I knock on wood, you will see sustainability come back pretty quickly front and center. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that's a 2021 thing. Yeah, I would say environmental sustainability is one of the key pillars of Clorox's strategy. So it is something we're going to continue to be committed to figuring out how to have better for you chemical disinfectants, alternative actives, less waste, more reuse, better packaging materials. Um, I do think the um, opposite trend that happened to e-commerce and COVID happened to sustainability. Well, I think e-commerce got accelerated five years. I do think you'll see a short-term deceleration in sustainability being implemented in the marketplace because of the focus that was just on getting germs killed, getting products out. So we had a lot of things got put on pause in the industry, but I don't hear any sign that long-term they're not gonna be picked back up because right. they are critically important to our, our health, our planet, all of it. Yeah. Uh, this question is uh, geared to Patrick. Uh, where are there are, where there are opportunities to upgrade the hygiene platform in your buildings as they prepare to reopen and assuming adequate supply, what are some of the obstacles your team is facing that prevent your team from being able to upgrade systems now versus waiting for reopening? I, I think that we've upgraded um, on a pretty consistent basis. Um, when I'm, I'm looking at, um, you know, processes that we're putting into place, it really has an approval uh, program to it. When we come in and we meet with a customer and we start telling them about the options of, of how we would look at uh, re-entry into the facility, um, that's, that's a combination of, of how they feel about the facility, mm -hmm. uh, what they believe best practices will be, um, and, and how uh, they believe it will be perceived by their um, employees uh, from a safety standpoint, uh, from an aesthetic standpoint. Uh, so as we continue to, to work our way through it, I think the, the obstacles are really going to be, um, you know, what people are willing to look at. I mean, it's been, a, like I said, it, it's such an opportunistic time right now to really take a look at the old cleaning performances and what we've done and change them and, and, and look at it differently and beta test what's taking place. And, and the facilities, although everyone thinks they're the same, they're not. There, there, are, stand, there are differences to facilities, their usages, et cetera. Um, but I would tell you that um, timing, um, the number of touch points that we're, that we're going to be dealing with, um, the consistency uh, of the work that's being performed, um, that's really what it's coming down to now. It's really focused on the quality of the work. Mm -hmm. So um, as, as people have looked at it, it, it was speed for a very long period of time. How fast can we get through this? This is a quicker product. Now people are looking at, you know, what's the safest way to go? What's, what are going to make people comfortable? Um, you know, again, our, our hope and our goal as we move forward is to be able to put plans in place that get people back into the workplace comfortably uh, where they feel that they are in a, in a safe area. 
uh, and it's going to be done in multiple ways, as I mentioned, you know, suppliers, manufacturers, Harvard maintenance, but even to the client base where they are now cleaning their own workstations uh, and having uh, a Clorox uh, wipe at their disposal to use to clean their area. And then the follow up by the janitorial right. staff, all of that's going to be part of the process as we move forward. Great. Uh, this question is from Gina. How do you see the industry manufacturer leaders competing with all of the pop-up brands of chemicals, equipment, et cetera, in the future? With the inability to keep up with demand, it seems there was a lot of no-name products seeping into the market. Um, some of them with less money and sometimes with less regulating, uh, kind of along the lines of, of, of the tequila smelling uh, hand sanitizer, right, Jason? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think this is something as a national brand we deal with all the time and it hit a fever pitch because of the supply constraints. Um, I do believe over time, um, the name brands, the quality products with the training processes, the regulate, you know, regulatory approvals, we will um, do well in that competition over time. But yes, there was a short term need for product and a void was filled. Um, but I don't foresee it being a long term impediment to national brands and products. I believe, and Christine, it's really, and it's not just because of the name brand, it's because the quality the name brand right, puts out, right? Yeah. And I would say like, look, there's always innovation, right? It's capitalism, right? New companies yeah. will emerge, but the ones that will stick provide a great product at a fair price, right? Like, exactly. I mean, I, I think, you know, basically when we were desperate, all of us in different stages of the supply chain here, we were taking in stuff that probably wasn't ideal. We were, it was making sure it was safe, but I mean, you would have rather have Clorox, maybe you were taking brand X or whatever else it was. I think some of the products that filled voids will be relevant that were really good. I think the stuff that wasn't as good, you know, will not be relevant. Right. And there was some great innovation that came out of necessity. And I think to Jason's yeah. point, there's some stuff that didn't exist that will continue to exist. And it's quite interesting. Right. So it's not so much, oh, the temporary stuff will go away. The other stuff will come back. It's the stuff that's really good is going to go forward. The stuff that wasn't as good is going to go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I, Laura, I think that this is a uh, uh, direct it more to you. Um, they're curious if you could speak to any correlation between the enhanced protocols we've seen and a customer's willingness to pay a higher price for those products and services. Um, well, you know, it all depends on the industry. I mean, we see a lot more um, less price sensitivity in healthcare, obviously, you know, those budgets um, for environmental services in hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers, they always, you know, on average spend more on those products and are really concerned about the, the kill claims, the specifications and so on. Uh, whereas, you know, a K through 12 public school, they're obviously going to be looking at what's going to keep the, you know, staff and students safe, but that, you know, is going to fall within their budget. Um, so, you know, I think it just very much depends on the industry vertical. I think, you know, some of the large hospitality, as we've seen already, is, you know, they're partnering with their chemical suppliers and putting up signage that, you know, the elevator's been cleaned with X brand. And, and you know, we will see more and more of that um, moving forward. But I think there's absolutely overall just kind of a higher level of spending. Um, on these products across the industry. Um, as long as it's not, you know, like government facilities, obviously uh, schools, they always kind of operate on a tighter budget for cleaning. I think they've probably, you know, gone, obviously they've spent a lot more in the past year than they had in the past on those products, but they will continue to be scrutinized a little bit closer than, you know, some of the healthcare type spending. Yeah, and I would sort of, uh top on what Laura is saying, I think when you see fundamental changes in behavior, it's based on three factors, right? It's fear, regulation, or there's money to be made. So I think for each industry, those factors will play out differently, right? And you can't point to where they're all, they're all going to land because we don't know where regulation is going to land for some of these mm -hmm. um, industry sectors. We don't know what the level of consumer and human fear is, and nor do we know like in hospitality, there's an opportunity to make money if you make people safe. So if they see it as a revenue generator, so mm -hmm. it's going to be how those factors impact each vertical in each circumstance. Perfect. 
Well, thank you all. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. And we have so many questions that we didn't uh, get through. Uh, and we have discussed at Hygieia of, of possibly continuing this discussion uh, in another webinar. So stay tuned for that. So thank you all of you for the time. Uh, it's really been, been enlightening. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back to Felicia. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. I want to give a special thank you once again to our moderator, Michelle, uh, Rachel Rutowski, our panelists, Laura Myasha, Patrick Mullen, Jason Tillis, and Christine Tucker. You guys did a fantastic job. Uh, the recording and the presentation will be available uh, within a few days. Uh, so we, we have to prep those documents and we'll get that out to you. Um, also, thank you again to our webinar sponsor, American Paper Converting, uh, which is a minority and woman-owned business led by President Lydia Work, who is also a Hygieia uh, Council member. Um, like American Paper Converting, I encourage you uh, to support Hygieia Network uh, with an individual donation today or by becoming a corporate partner. Um, you can give at hygienetwork.org forward slash give. Um, your support uh, helps us to continue our mission uh, to advance women uh, in the industry um, via our conferences, our webinars, our mentoring program, uh, and our online network community. So to learn more about the ISSA Hygieia Network programs, please visit hygienetwork.org. That's hygienetwork.org. This concludes our webinar and we look forward to seeing you at an upcoming Hygieia program. Enjoy the rest of your day.